Hi everyone, good evening. I'd like to thank everyone for tuning into this very special session on Joginder Paul's Land Lust, organized by The Scroll and the publishing house Naogi Books. Let me introduce myself first. I am Arushi Punya, a doctoral research scholar in the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences. I'm working on the narration of dehumanization and superfluity in Dalit and Palestinian literature, which is why for someone like me, uh, Jamindar Paul's Lamb Lust was a very interesting text. And uh, I think it will be for the common reader as well, particularly because it represents African life in a very new way. This is the book. It is Joginder Paul's Land Lust, and um, it was initially published in 1962 as Dharti Ka Kaal. And what's really interesting is that this book was actually published in Urdu. And uh, thanks to Neogi Books now, in 2019, it was published in English. Um, we are here with the two editors of uh, the book, Sukrita Paul Kumar and Vandana R. Singh. Before we dive into the text and the discussion, let me introduce them. Sukrita Paul Kumar uh, is a noted poet and critic and was born and brought up in Kenya. She held the Aruna Asraf Ali Chair at Delhi University till recently. Formerly a fellow of the Indian Institute of Advanced Study in Shilla, she is also a fellow of the prestigious International Writing Program in Iowa and Hong Kong Baptist University. As an honorary faculty at Dual Center at Corfu, which is in Greece, she is a recipient of many prestigious fellowships and residencies. She has to her credit several collections of poems in English, many translated into Indian and foreign languages. Her critical writings are mainly on partition, modern Indian fiction, and gender. Her latest translations include Blind, which is a novel, and Nude, a collection of poems. A guest editor of journals such as Manoa, which is based in Hawaii, she has also held solo exhibitions of her paintings. Many of Sukrita's poems emerge from her experience of working with homeless people and tsunami victims. Welcome, Sukrita, and thank you so much for being with us. I'd like to introduce Vandana R. Singh next. Uh, she is an author, translator, and an editor, and was given the award of recognition for outstanding contribution to literature by the Chandigarh Sahitya Academy. Her literary translations from Hindi to English have been published earlier. She has authored several books on communication skills and ELP for Oxford University Press. She has been a consultant editor for several UN organizations and textbook developer for NCRT and NIOS. A PhD in Indian writings in English, she has been the associate professor of English at GCG Punjab University and has worked as a bilingual teacher for the Manchester Education Community in UK. She views translation as a social responsibility contributing to building cross-cultural bridges. She's fascinated by words, their origin and evolution. Welcome, Mandana. It's very Thank nice you. to have you on board. So um, let me pose my first question to Sukrita, and who also happens to be Joginder Paul's daughter. And uh, I think what is really interesting about Joginder Paul's life, and let's begin there, is that he's one of the few people to have experienced different kinds of dispossession and movement. So he was first a refugee from Ambala, which is, uh, I mean, that part or region now, which is now in Pakistan. And he moved uh, as in exile to Kenya. And then he moved back to India. Uh, so he's actually uh, experienced these different theoretical stages in his life. And, uh, and we obviously understand how movement has been such an important part for even if some of our favorite writers, like Sada Kassim Manto. And not unlike him, even Paul has written on partition as well. So um, I wonder if you could comment a little bit about this phase of movement, constant movement in Paul's life and how that has had an impact on his writing. Yeah, I guess, you know, um, at the outset, I'd like to thank uh, both Niyogi and Scroll.in for this program. And thank you so much, uh, Arushi, for posing the questions. Uh, I would uh, begin by saying that, you know, obviously, since I happen to be the daughter of this author, Joginder Paul, I also uh, was in exile with him. I was born when he called himself to be, I mean, he thought of himself as being in exile in Kenya. And that was soon after uh, he suffered. He was kind of a victim of partition. And he was from Sialkot. 
And uh, as Salman Rushdie puts it, you know, forever uh, in his context, there was this theme that was a running theme of going back home. And as Salman, as Salman Rushdie puts it, um, this actually becomes a kind of a search for some kind of an imaginary home for all his life, you know, while in exile. And this is what he kind of passed uh, on to me as well as a child, you know, when I was small and I was in Kenya. I mean, this was an often uttered phrase. We have to go back home, back home. Now, we didn't have as children, we didn't have the concept of what is going back because it was only a futuristic home somewhere. And therefore, in a way, I had a little bit of a quarrel with my father because I said, you denied us a home. We could have homed in Kenya, you know, as children. However, this also became a creative concept in a way, you know, while he was in exile, because he uh, he called this was, of course, a kind of a chosen in a way chosen exile, but only in the context of the fact that um, he was a refugee. So it was a double exile feeling, a refugee almost, a refugee forever. And I think he found a very creative solution to that in a way as a writer, because he was constantly engaging himself with this whole idea of alienation and uh, being an outsider uh, in search of a home and uh, partition experience for kind of the content of his sh short story for a very long time. Eventually also he wrote a novel called Papro, which was uh, translated as sleepwalkers. And uh, so basically the idea was that he himself was like a sleepwalker, you know, who was always walking, walking towards some home. But to bring back the discussion to landlust, I must say this, that in Dharti Ka Kal, which is the Urdu title for this particular volume, what it seems to me, and, and the more I think about it, the greater I feel that perhaps he was trying to home in Kenya while engaging with the uh, with the blacks out there by engaging with the people of the land as it were and not engaging so much with the Asians there or the white men there. He was engaging far more uh, with the African people out there, the black man who was otherwise invisible. And I remember the visibility that we used to experience of the black person in the domestic sphere as helpers who would be helpers in the kitchen and so on. But they were invisible out there on the street because it was a very, in a way, officially there was no apartheid, you know, but there was a kind of practice of apartheid out there in terms of the social behavior of people and incipient racism that was at work. So the African character personality was not available on the streets, was not in our schools. They were not, they had separate schools, if at all. And they were supposed to be people of the jungles, you know. So I think this whole idea of getting in a way, you know, getting out of his own country, Sialkot. It was Sialkot, which was his land, you know. So from there to Ambala in a camp, refugee camp, and then from there to Kenya. So it's kind of a double exile kind of an experience. And therefore, I think some of that got passed on to me as well. But the main thing is that he, as a writer, was always possessed with the idea of, as I said, in uh, you know, going back home. And it, to me, I would like to look, I don't know if Vandana is an outsider to that experience, what she may have to say about it. But I think to me, even finding space in creative writing, um, it was like homing. It's a metaphor of homing that I would like to use here. So um, that's actually very interesting, and it ties up to my next question as well. Um, that you know, I mean, you're talking about the invisibility of African life in Africa. So how do you think that um, Paul was able to give a certain kind of visibility to African life by creating a public run through his literature? And particularly, why do you think he chose Urdu to do that, and not English, or not Hindi, or not Punjabi, which are, I presume, the other languages that he's familiar with, given the fact that he was an English teacher in Kenya? So why do you think that he chose Urdu in particular to narrate these experiences of African life, of interaction of Asian life with Africans? And uh, if you could also tell us about, you know, what was his journey? Was it difficult to publish such a book in Urdu? Um, 
and yeah. Yeah. Uh, Vandana, would you like to take this or the earlier part of the question or do you want me to take it on? No, uh, please go on. No, I think I will just address that part of the question, which is to do with why did he choose to write in Urdu? You see, he, he was already a writer. It's not as if when he went to Kenya, he was not writing. He was writing. He was very young. He was only 22 at that time when, when he got married at 22, 23. And he was already a writer. But the, the uh, you know, it's kind of, he, he regarded, though he spoke, uh, he spoke in Punjabi at home. He taught English, but he was taught uh, in school uh, a lot of Urdu. And he inherited a lot of uh, Urdu from uh, basically the ambience in which he grew up and so on. And he had a love for that language. And he was regard he regarded that language as the language of his pen, as his creative thought, the expression for his thought and experience. And so he continued with that practice. It's not as if he chose to write in Urdu. It was almost like a compulsive kind of a phenomenon. However, he was also concerned about the fact that this, whatever experience that was going into Urdu language, how would it reach out to people who were not reading Urdu in Kenya? You know, he was concerned about it, but he became a broadcaster as well. So he was reading out his stories uh, in Urdu, of course, he was reading them out in Urdu, but brought, they were broadcasted all over in Kenya, in Kenya Broadcasting Service. I still remember that. So a lot of Asians became part of that audience, you know, even if they were not able to read Urdu. Hmm. So um, that's actually very interesting. And I think it's almost as though he's created a home for African life within Urdu, which is, I think, such a creative endeavor on his part. Um, and kudos to him for that. Uh, so my next question is for Vandana. And, um, you know, I mean, we, of course, know about white supremacy. So what do you think is the representation of the relationship of Asians with African life in these stories? And what we find in, in these stories is that Asians often consider themselves superior to Africans. Um, and they, while maintain subservience to the Europeans there, so could you perhaps maybe discuss this particular aspect of the short stories? Yeah, thank you, Arushi. Um, I'm glad you asked that question because um, I, I think it's extremely important to uh, not only talk about Jugendar Paul as a writer, it's uh, equally important to understand the relevance of his writing uh, even today. Um, Jugendar Paul has a very vast canvas of work which touches upon a number of aspects of human life and existence. Uh, particularly in Landlust, uh, Paul chooses to take us into a land far away from his place of birth. And uh, in this adopted home, he walks us through any number of heart-wrenching scenes and situations of discrimination and inequality. And uh, as we read Paul today, we realized with horror that the unequal racist world he wrote about <clears throat> almost 70 years ago is still alive and working. And as seen recently in the case of George Floyd and what eventually became the Black Lives uh, Matter movement, we realized that uh, not only is racism very much alive, uh, it is also choking and strangulating and literally sucking the life out of the have-nots and that too in broad daylight. And this is exactly what, what Paul Fear assuming 70 years ago, that Really speaking, racism has become even more subtle now and therefore more deadly. Um, in Kenya uh, of uh, Paul, we see strains of selective development and multi-layered racism. We also see, as you said, the oppressed very quickly turning into oppressors. And we see the curse of racism being institutionalized, of becoming socially acceptable and actually being passed on from one generation to the next, almost like valued inheritance. It's as though racism is some kind of family silver that you, you pass on from one generation to another. Um, while projecting racism, colonization, and selective development 
uh, Paul's stories also take a, take us into take into their ambit the tussle between nature and development. And interestingly, here nature includes the natives, um, and the resulting dynamics between the existing social cultural class bound realities um, is is something to be experienced while reading uh, the stories. And uh, I am. I'd especially like to mention the story Jambo Rafiki, translated by Usha Nagpal. It's one of Paul's most brilliant stories. It subtly explores the naivety of the locals. It uh, also gives us a glimpse of the social pecking order, which is very well defined. Uh, Paul talks of the laying of the railway line, which he speaks of metaphorically, and he talks of it uh, he describes it as this deadly serpent, which is making inroads into the interiors of Africa. And it's really a comment of what atrocities can be committed in the name of development. And we still see that happening all around us. And this serpent-like railway races ahead, leaving the natives behind to fend for themselves. And the fast expanding railway line penetrates into the heart of the land. It, as I said, that story has to be read. It has to be experienced. It has to be lived. Because the, the, the images that that serpent-like railway line evokes is something that stays with you for a long, long, long time. The natives in the end of the story are seen, as I said, left standing by the wayside. And the colonizers, of course, have never had it so good. Um, Arushi, do you like yeah. yeah, so uh, that actually ties up to my next question, which is that, I mean, it's about the editorial process. Why is it that you both thought that you know the world needs to know these stories in English, which is I mean different from the original language the short stories were written in? And could you talk a little bit about the editorial process? What do you think is this work now achieving 70 or 60 years later in English in a different language, creating a wider public realm through English? So um, Vandana, maybe you could go first and then hopefully Sukrita can add in about yeah. the editorial process. So uh, while we talk of the, of the editorial process, I would also uh, include the the journey of the translators here, yeah. uh, because um, as it happened, I also translated one of the stories. So for, for me, it was a bit of both. Um, Joginder Paul's style of writing is is philosophic, and the the quality of the passages is so lyrical. Uh, it's prose that feels more like poetry. So as a translator, you start out thinking that you are going to be translating uh, prose. But there are moments when you end up actually translating poetry. Um, to capture the essence of Paul Saab's style of writing, and I'm really not exaggerating here, is like trying to capture the scent of a rose and transferring it to another flower. and in the case of landless, that flower is a flower that grows in another continent. Yeah. So uh, there were challenges, extremely interesting challenges. And uh, but as they say, the higher the peak you climb, the more exhilarating is the view. So once we were done with the translation, it it gave us a huge sense of satisfaction uh, to be doing this. Uh, talking of the editing, I just like to hear very quickly talk about what Joginder Paul himself felt about writing uh, before I ask Sukrita to add to this. Um, Joginder Paul is one of those writers who takes his role as a storyteller very seriously. And the sanctity of the art of storytelling has a very special meaning for him. In one of his stories, uh, in one of his interviews, I'm sorry, he draws an interesting analogy comparing the storyteller with God Almighty. And he says that the creator of the universe is the most invisible aspect of the universe. And drawing inspiration for, from this, he goes on to say that this is how the writer of a story must be in the story, should be invisible, omniscient, but never omnipresent. Sukrita, would you like to add to that? Yeah, I think this is a very interesting aspect uh, that you have taken up, Vandana. But um, I, I would like to say that, you know, in his context, it's very interesting that many of the stories, of course, there is this whole idea of uh, uh, 
um, you know, uh, going into the depth of a certain experience. And uh, most of the experiences here are to do with the Asians' responses and reactions and relationships with the Africans. And uh, his pain regarding all that, you know, the, the basically what the point that Vandana made about how the oppressed is actually here, the oppressor when it comes to the Asian. And mind you, it was the Asian world there, not the Indian or the Pakistani world. There was no division. And th there were Indians and, uh, you know, Pakistanis and all clumped together as 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 uh, clamped together as uh, Asians, and um, the African was the 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 one that was getting exploited in all possible ways in in a variety of ways, and what one was actually saw was that many of these short stories now and I was too small when they were being written, but um, my mother tells me that. In fact, there are quite a few of the stories which come from his personal experience. Some of them were actually very lived experiences. So it becomes a very strange phenomenon as to how a very personal experience takes the shape of an impersonal kind of an appeal. And such an appeal that even today they become relevant, you know. So that whole creative process, which he really worked hard on, I would say, very hard on in the sense that he was basically very conscious that he doesn't have to appear himself as a writer in the short story. And therefore, there was this objective distancing that he maintained, despite the fact that there were the experiences which were very personal and very private, some of them. You know, particularly, I would like to refer to uh, the um, story Miracle. Which I have always enjoyed, you know. To, uh, it's a story which is actually to do with uh, uh, um, a kind of a mir miraculous lake in Kenya. And I still remember going for a picnic there, you know, where you stand on the land which actually moves because underneath, under, a, under that land, narrow piece of land, there is water. There's a lake. It's called Lake Kikuyu. And Lake Kikuyu, actually, you can see it moving. You can feel it moving as you walk on that. And the, uh, the, the, I remember that experience when, you know, we would go there as Asians going for a picnic with, you know, all kinds of bags and picnic bags and everything. And then you could see that these little African boys will turn up and uh, coming from here and there everywhere. Why? Because they would want to show some kind of a tabasha, you know, what would that be? Jump into the depth of the, uh, uh, into the lake to pick up the coins that the Asians will throw into the lake. And this was sport for the Asians, but it was very threatening. It was life threatening for these little boys to go into the lake, jump into the lake. So the, the story actually ends very beautifully. I won't go into the entire story, but at the end it says, oh, what is a, what a miracle it is that the entire continent of Africa is not shaking under your feet because of this kind of an experience. So the pain comes out of, and that's something to do with the style of the writer also, because he would uh, give one line, which would be a kind of, should we call it a punch line or something, which would come at the end and it would change the whole scenario. So that Lake Kikuyu metaphor becomes a metaphor for the entire oppressed Africa, which should actually be trembling with the kind of oppression that is suffered. So that had something to do with uh, the style of the author. And in, in Urdu, the story is called Mojaza, which is uh, translated as the miracle. In fact, that was going to be my next question that uh, for Sukhita, that why do you think that he chose the short story in particular? And for me, especially in Miracle as well, what distinguishes his short, his short stories the most is, of course, the punchline, but also this consistent soft satire that runs through all the short stories. And uh, for me, in particular, what was really interesting is the distinctiveness of perspectives that he brings, like you said, that all the stories are either written from, of course, a first-person Asian perspective or an omniscient narration. But what is most crucial is that he also writes from the first-person perspective of Africans. And in literary terms, we refer to that as focalization, which is when you represent who sees 
and it's the African who sees in his short story. So again, I mean, just for a quick question for both of you, what do you think um, really sets apart his short stories the most? You know, I think the, the, I would like to take on this question about, you know, why, why the short story? I think that was the form that he actually chose. He tried his hand at poetry, I'm told, sometime uh, as a college student, you know. And, um, uh, and he said that, you know, he, he felt that that was not complete. He wanted a more concrete experience. Though, as Vandana rightly says, that when you really end up um, uh, reading his short story and when you sit down to translate it, you realize that there is a lot of, you know, philosophic and poetic content in it. And so lyricism is up. There's a flow in Urdu, which is very difficult to capture in English language. So I know how much Kirti Ramachandran or even Chandana Datta and Minakshi Bharat all, and Vandana and all those Usha Nagpal, how much they struggled to get to the core. And I, as the editor, was pushing them more and more along with Vandana to see that we come as close to the original as possible. And of course, we've even at the end of it all, we felt that there was a lot of loss in translation, but perhaps there was also a gain because there was a kind of a communication that happened. We, we got the stories out of the lock, as it were, you know, into the, the locks that are around Urdu language, which not many people can read anyway. So it reaches out. So short story, he, I think, did involve deliberately uh, he deliberately chose that form, perhaps to be able to cover a lot of as aspects, a lot of dimensions, um, which each standing in its own autonomy, as it were. Points of references would be there. So there is a running theme, yes, of incipient racism, which you talk about how it's subtly ironic and subtly there is that whole idea of uh, ambivalence also that comes up, the interplay of that. He did not want it to be, it becomes one story if you put all the stories together. And yet it's not a novel. It is giving you different autonomous experience of the injustice, social injustice that was witnessed by him. And at a very human level, and as uh, it was just pointed out, sometimes, you know, in a story like Slump, for instance, he's actually, it is from the point of view of the African also. It's almost like the African's uh, uh, narrativity has come in, you know, it's been forefronted. The narrator, he almost appears as a narrator there, as though he's watching how these Asians are sitting in a club and drinking away and talking about the slump in the economy. And ultimately, who are the people who are actually suffering ironically when the protagonist, two Africans, come up in the scene at the end of the story? It is they who are only catching on to the leftovers in the party, you know, even if it is a small drink in the uh, leftover drink in a glass. So uh, it comes very subtly, but it hits hard if you pause and think about it. And you do, you're compelled to think. In fact, one of the similar moments that happens in Miracle, like you were talking about, is this uh, moment when Asians think that they are superior to barbaric Africans because they have an ancient civilization. And for me, uh, as, as a researcher on caste, that's so interesting because you can't talk about Indian civilization or culture without talking about caste. And yet you have these Asians here who are very uncritical of their own heritage and uh, replicating an entire racial system in another continent. Uh, while having fought off um, the Europeans in their home country, but replicating the same system in a very insidious way in a different continent. And uh, I think for me, what was really interesting was that Paul does not spare himself as well from this. You know, he implicates himself as a narrator in a lot of stories where the Asian perspective is represented, um, complicit with the dehumanization of African lives with respect to, you know, young boys jumping into the water for just a few shillings. And um, and he doesn't show himself like an enlightened or a woke Asian, you know, as though I am any different from any of these other Asians. And I think that uh, self-reflexivity, which he brings to his short stories, is uh, particularly telling. And um, and I think uh, for me, what really stands out is in his particular story, you realize which is. At last, you realize that there is no end to man's colonial and imperial desire. He even wants to colonize planets, and you realize, and the Africans are like, 
you know, we will never be a part of this imperial dream. We will always be away from that. And it's a 60 year old text, but you realize that things perhaps have not changed yet for Africans in that sense. And they are still included from that particular kind of American dream or imperial dream. So Vandana, would you like to comment on that? Referring to any yeah. Uh, just to add to um, what uh, the point that I was making earlier uh, about uh, Jugendar Paul uh, and his writing style and uh, how he saw, viewed the role of the writer. Um, so uh, not only was he an invisible writer, he was also an extremely empathetic writer. And as you said, that he, he does not stop at implicating himself also. So, so he lives the story, he creates the story, he writes the story. He, he, it's not just a person sitting there with a pen in his hand and creating a story. He, he actually lives it. Um, he was convinced that the writer has to live the story, he has to read the story, and he must make it his own experience. Of course, the story is born out of imagination, as we all know. But true creative experience can only emanate from a position of complete empathy. And uh, I'd like to um, read out a quote here uh, from one of Jupiter Paul's interviews. And he says here, I have suffered every single one of my stories. I have experienced them in such a way that my characters often appear to be nothing but reflections of my own being. Even when I'm no more, I'm sure I will remain alive by virtue of my characters. The grain of life is the same after all. And if it is so, where do people go after they have lived through their own lives? I went on slipping naturally into the open so that I may realize the desire of my own life in the lives of others. When, when, you, when you read words like this, and when you take on the responsibility of uh, editing his stories or translating the stories, you realize that it's, it's a huge responsibility. Because if you want to do justice to these stories, if you want to do justice to the person who was writing these stories, uh, then you have to step into his shoes. You have to step into the writer's shoes, walk around in them. You also have to get into the story. You have to also step into the shoes of the characters in the story. And so, as I said, it's a, it's a huge responsibility. And um, I recall, Sukrita, those days when we used to be sitting together for hours and long calls and mulling over how to retain the cultural ambience in the book, whether to retain Swahili and Hindustani words or to treat them, whether to have a glossary or to not have a glossary, whether to italicize or to not italicize. There, was, there were so many different layers of things to look into as editors. And interestingly here, uh, usually in a work of translation, you would be looking at two languages, two cultures, uh, maybe two races. But here, it, there, there were these multiple cultures, multiple races, multiple languages. And, um, and there was Swahili which Sukrita might know a little bit of. She may remember a few words from her childhood. But for me, it was an absolutely new experience. So, um, yeah, so there were these, these extremely interesting, um, as I said, layers of different areas that we needed to look into and, uh, and do it the way the writer would have wanted us to do it. Do it the way that he may have visualized it as being in English. I don't know if he ever thought that it may be translated one day. Sukrita may know or I, I, I really don't think any writer really thinks about what this story will look like or read like in another language. But, uh, but yes, uh, if you want to be true to a translation, I think as translators, it becomes very important to think of that aspect of translating. See, yeah, if I may add to this, I think there was this tremendous uh, debate that we had whether to retain the Swahili words. Yeah. And I remember the conclusion that we arrived at was that, you know, um, it's important to retain some of them. It was very important. How would the story retain then 
the ambience of um, Africa or particularly Kenya to which, uh, you know, Swahili belongs, you know. And uh, so, you know, words like Mungu, God, or uh, Makati, that is Chapati, you know, and many words like that. Which he, and I, I remember we discussed this point that if the author has retained them in Urdu, he's not translating them in Urdu, right? He's retaining them in Urdu. So why should we not retain them in English? There was a purpose there as to why the African words should be there. So I think all in all, there was this tremendous desire to be as faithful and at the same time, the translation to be beautiful, you know. And I always say that I think faithful uh, in translation and to be able to retain the beauty, that is the challenge that the uh, translator has. And I think there was also another kind of imagination, if I may, Arushi, talk a little bit about that. And that imagination had a lot to do again with the mythopoeic translate, uh, imagination, not translation, imagination of the author in a story like Landlust. He created a whole mythology there. I'm not sure that the African mythology created Kilimanjaro as the god. No, it didn't. But he created a mythology just as the Africans would have a mythology, perhaps. And of, you know, how the whites were reaching out lustfully, capturing all land, as you referred to. And this land, they're, they're actually discussing this. Two naive, almost naive Africans with a certain kind of innocence. They are talking about how the white man not only will it take up the peak of Kilimanjaro, which is the highest mountain in, in Kenya, not really, not really only reach that point, he, he will probably go to the moon as well. And there was some talk going on whether you know the white man reaching the American context, particularly reaching the moon. And the African was saying, oh, my God, you know, our God is letting it happen. Our God, Mount Kilimanjaro, is letting it happen. So is there some divine sanction to that? You know, poses like things of this kind, where you see on the one hand the cleverness of the whites in terms of their imperialistic design, and on the other hand a certain kind of innocence of the native that is coming. But they are very wise otherwise, you know. But in a sense, in the context of also what we call development. And that, of course, comes up again in another story. Um, let me come to what is, for me, at least the most crucial part of uh, Paul's project, which is about representation of African life. And um, except in the short story, oh, I feel that Africans are represented as humble objects of pity or sympathy, but not as rebellious subjects, given the history of Kenya and perhaps Sukruta, you could talk about that in, a, in, in just a very brief moment. And I wonder today, how would we look at this uh, representation of African life? And um, I wonder if Paul's narration has an, what we could call an oriental case, uh, given that post-colonial scholars like Edward Said believe that orientalists or people who studied the Orient actually created the Orient instead of unraveling it or revealing it. So similarly, it would be said that the African is constructed and not revealed through the imperial days. So where do we place Paul on this dynamic? On one side, you have this self-representation by African writers at this time as well. But you also have this entirely imperial project on the side, which is creating the African for the entire world. And I feel that somewhere, at least that's my intuition, that Jovinder Paul is somewhere in the middle in that in that dynamic. So would so so I think we have to remember this one point that uh, we're talking about 1960s when uh, Gugi was also writing that play called The Trial of Deacon Kamati, you know, and we know that the Mau Mau uh, movement was going very strong and there was a lot of aggression on the part of the African. In fact, it was a very violent game going on in terms of fighting for independence. And we were there at that in 63, in some time, 63 in Kenya got its independence. So before that, there was a bloody bath going on and, and also this whole idea of quit India, the way it happens. And in one of the, uh, quit India happened in 1942 in India, but it was happening happening in 50s in Kenya, you know, quit Kenya kind of thing. And it didn't happen as violently as it did happen in Uganda, uh, 
But certainly, you know, the Maasais, the Kikuyu tribes, they were getting very aggressive and rightfully in one sense because they wanted the Britishers to be out. And in in, in Landlust, you do have at least two stories that are talking about how, you know, even in the madhouse, for instance, you know, or the blind home, for instance, where there is this white woman who is trying to uh, protect all the blind children, take care of them, and so on. And she says, in fact, I am the eyes for all of you. And it's a white woman who's saying that. And so I think in the author's imagination, and not just in imagination, out of what he also witnessed, you cannot really denounce a whole uh, race also, you know, uh, in totality. So he basically was looking at humanity, very humane context of a white woman reaching out and not wanting to leave the blind home when the Africans made her do that eventually. She had to leave eventually. We, you know, when you're reading the story, you feel she'll never do that. But towards the end, she's made to leave. So somewhere I think that aggression again comes not, uh, we don't see the scene of how, 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 you know, Africans are actually getting violent. But you see that violence, almost rightfully that violence at work. And so there are those sounds, those um, kind of uh, feeling that feelings that are evoked for the uh, the right feelings that are evoked for the struggle for independence in the country but without becoming very overt so i think that there are there is ambivalence portrayal is not out there in the face but it's there as a very uh, very prominent kind of a, um, undercurrent in the stories the voice that is given to the african that is where I think you find the strength. That's true. And um, as we move towards concluding this discussion, I'd also like to discuss the short story, Multiracial, which actually makes you realize that race is actually a social construct and not a biological fact. And science was actually marshaled to support race theory, which itself was created to justify um, the imperialist project. And we realize that the idea of multiraciality is actually a sham. There's always going to be a hierarchy between the races. And uh, we find that particularly in the current movement of Black Lives Matter as well, that the minute you say all lives matter, um, but uh, it, there's something lost when you say that. And uh, what is telling in uh, Paul's short stories is that the Indian speaking for the abolition of multiraciality is the one who doesn't sit, wish to sit at the bar with Africans at the end. So I feel that's what at least it's the consistency in Paul's story, the point that he's always driving home, is that Indians are not sufficiently critical of race um, as they were in their own context. In the African context, they are not as critical. And uh, he consistently draws attention to the Indians' hypocrisy of that. So Vandana, would you like to refer to any other particular stories or any ones that were your favorite in this context? Uh, yes. Uh, talking of... Uh, multi layers of uh, racism that are uh, at 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 play here um i i i i think the the aggression or let us say the the oppression rather of the of the british or of the caucasian races is is obvious and um, I, I assume that uh, perhaps an average african is aware of it and is is perhaps even watchful. But it is this, uh, it's the oppression of the Asians, specifically the Indian community here, which is really very difficult to gauge because there is, uh, it, it is not overt. It is very covert. Uh, the Asians uh, have this sense of superiority, but then they would talk about it to a fellow Asian or to a fellow Indian. For instance, these two characters in the story, Miracle, when they talk, when they say that there is no culture here or that there are no intelligent people here to, to talk to. It's not like being back home in India where we have intelligent people to speak to. Um, and yet they do not really have the, if I may use the word courage, uh, might be inappropriate usage of the word here, but um, they would not actually say that to a local person, but they experience it all the time. And they wallow in this sense of superiority, 
uh, we have the um, the grandmother in uh, one of the stories i think it's miracle who says that uh, british rule is the best yeah she she actually says british rule is the best um and uh, there is uh, in the story rascal this man he's talking about uh, his wife and he says that uh, uh, his wife does not openly say anything about a local person so which he says is a very good quality that his wife has so um, the indian community there is perhaps as racist as any other but for reasons of their own they it, it's a very inward kind of a racism they they perhaps it comes from their own experience of colonization perhaps in their subconscious minds they know what it is like to be colonized and yet it is this sense of superiority they that they very consciously feed into uh, which um, which affects everything every action every interaction with a local person that they have their suspicion of boys who are the house boys who work inside their homes their yeah. suspicion of of uh, any local person that they might cross on the street uh, and yet they they are never as i said able to come out in the open with this so so the the racism in the indian mind is also multi layered it's there and yet it's covert so um let's conclude this uh, discussion let me just show the book once again this is land lust uh, by joginder paul and it's edited by sukita paul kumar and vandana ar singh it's a fascinating collection of short stories about uh, asians engaging with race and i think it's a pertinent read especially in today's climate when black lives matter for you as an asian to ask yourself how can you engage with race So thank you so much uh, Scroll and Yogi Books for organizing this event. I'd like to thank all our viewers for today. And then thank you Sukrita and Vandana for this very very interesting discussion and uh, I think we like to sign off now.